Good morning. I hope that uh, all of your teams won yesterday. My team did. Of course, we beat Duke, which is like beating a junior high girls team. <laughs> That's not fair. That's not fair. Senior high girls team. That, I, let's be clear. I, uh, I have 33 minutes to try to wrap up a series that really could go on for weeks, if not months, if not years. Because what we've been looking at for the last several weeks are the counterintuitive teachings of Christ. And the series has been called upside down because when we look at our lives compared to the teachings of Christ, one of us looks upside down. And I've come to the conclusion that it's me. And for most of us, that's true. So if you're frustrated that we haven't gotten to the counterintuitive teachings of Christ that you really wanted to get to, I share your frustration, but that's a good thing. Because my goal is to create a hunger within each and every one of you that you will become an apprentice of Jesus Christ and that you will begin to read for yourself, uh, dig into the depths of what Christ actually says. And I would encourage you, again, to pick up uh, the secondary resource that's been so influential in my life as I've been uh, going through this series, and that is Dallas Willard's uh, The Divine Conspiracy. Again, if you haven't picked up that text I would encourage you to do it. It's not an easy read, but to me, it's as as important uh, in the Christian thought world as uh, Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. It's it's that significant in my mind, so I I would encourage you to pick that up, work through it with a group um, or just another person. Why are we living upside down? That's really what we've been talking about. We've been asking why and trying to, to point out Uh, Why why do we live inconsistently with what we say we believe? And it really comes down to this one simple concept. To believe something is true is to act as if it were so. Our actions betray or reveal our core convictions or lack thereof. Most of us believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose again. We, We believe that information about God and about what Christ did. Do we actually believe, though, that God's intentions for our real lives every day, do we believe those intentions are good? Do we believe that Christ is alive now and that for us to live this life, we must be in a vital relationship with him on a daily basis? Do we believe that this world, this life, our bodies, everyone that we know, our possessions, all of that belongs to God? Do we believe that we belong in this world, that our lives are are blessed and good And that we are chosen by God to live in his world now to bring God glory in our daily living. Do we believe God loves us? Do we really believe that? And do we actually love God back? Do we delight in God and his unique son, Jesus Christ, who shows us the face of God in his life, his teachings, his death and resurrection? Do we believe that it's good and safe to function and live our lives within the kingdom of heaven that is now? You see, if we believe all of those things are true, we will act as if it is so. And if we act as if it is so, then we will fulfill Christ's expectations for the church. We'll be a city on a hill. We'll be salt and light, and we will not be missed. We will function in the capacity of eternity. That's how significant our lives will be in this life now. But remember, Willer says there are two main contributors to us flying upside down. Number one is unbelief or misdirected assumptions about God. And number two is enslavement to habitual tendencies in thought, emotions, and actions that oppose the kingdom of God. And the work of the church then is to provide the training for for Christ followers to overcome their unbelief as well as these destructive habits of thinking, feeling, and action that that will then uh, bring about transformation. And this all, of course, it only happens through the power of the Holy Spirit and and God's Word. And so what is the goal? What, What is the whole point? The point is this, that we all become and we help people become passionate, selfless followers of Christ who live every day as Christ would live if Christ took on our identity and our circumstances. That, that's the goal of the Christian life. We're to become hearers and doers of the word and thus become those who build their house on the rock which stands firm in the storms of life. So how do we make that turn? You know, a lot of what we've been talking about is just kind of that reality that we are flying upside down and we've we've, found out a number of reasons why, but what do we do about that? 
And so this morning, uh, the title of my message is Making the Turn. And uh, before we go any further, I just want to pray with you. Lord, we have uh, come this far in this series as we look at what Christ actually wrote, what, uh, not what he wrote, but what was written about him, what he said, what he taught. We have come to the realization that, that a lot of times our lives look completely different, that what is normal in our world is anything but normal in yours. And Lord, we, we have asked you to help us with our unbelief. And this morning I pray that you would show us the beginning, the way of how we might make the turn, how we might begin to live our lives as if it were so. I thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit that will interpret uh, the word of God and, and hopefully whatever I have to say. I pray that your spirit will move and bring conviction in the lives of us all. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. You know, when we think about the Christian life, we all know that there's, there's got to be a, a supernatural reality that happens in order for us to live any way other than normal. And we call that the Holy Spirit. The movement of the Holy Spirit empowering and moving within us to have faith. And the Holy Spirit comes as Jesus says, as the wind blows, and also by virtue of the fact that we pray and we ask for faith, we ask for this life change. Remember, we did that, that's the way we began the service last week. But then we have realities in our everyday lives. We have kind of the, the humdrum of, of what happens to us, the circumstances, everything that's happened in our past, everything that's happening right now, it makes us who we are. And so whatever we're gonna say about spirituality and, and, and living according to the word of God, it has to happen in that place. And everything that's happened before and everything that's happening now has to be part of that equation. And then we have another part of our everyday lives, and that is what we actually choose to do. It, it's the plans that we make. It's the way that we exercise our bodies and our minds and, and, and our faith, our discipline. It's, it's the life that we have a choice about. And so um, Willard, in, in his text, Divine Conspiracy, creates a picture that I love. He calls it the golden triangle of spiritual growth because for Christians, it's made of gold because it's simple and it's valuable. And it's a triangle, which makes it easy for people like me because I need something very simple uh, to keep in my mind. The triangle has three sides. And just as a triangle has to have all three sides in order for it to be a triangle, so in the world of spiritual growth, there are really three essential aspects, and they're pretty much what we just talked about. The Holy Spirit, the days, uh, the trials of our daily life, and then the life that we choose, the life of spiritual disciplines. And what I'd like to do is touch um, on all three briefly. There's so much that we could say about all three, but I want you to have this picture in your mind as you leave here today of this triangle and of just these three things. The power of the Holy Spirit, the trials of our daily life, and spiritual disciplines. I'm going to focus on all three briefly, but I'm going to come back and really focus in on number two, because I think that's where a lot of us are living upside down and where our unbelief takes root in the deepest way. But first, the action of the Holy Spirit. Christ says in John 3, 5, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Paul restates that truth in 1 Corinthians 12, 3. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. We all know this to be true. Clearly, the turning of the heart towards Christ, where we repent of our sin and we ask Christ to be the Lord of our life, that comes as a result of the Holy Spirit moving in our life. Paul says in Ephesians 2 that faith is a gift from God. Now, th this has been a subject of, of great interest and debate uh, throughout Christian history. Do we believe first and then experience the transforming power of the Holy Spirit that turns our hearts towards Christ? Or do we believe because of the transforming power of the Holy Spirit moving and empowering us to believe? Those of us within the Reformed tradition are pretty confident that our ability to truly see Christ and believe in him is something that happens to us through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's really uh, it's true that we can ask for faith, but we can't manufacture it. Uh, the Bible is pretty clear that it's given to us. So the Holy Spirit actually confronts us. Remember a couple weeks ago in 1 Thessalonians, we were talking about the power of the gospel. 
The power of the gospel is when the gospel confronts a human life and the Holy Spirit moves within that heart and, and that person experiences a power that literally changes them. Uh, this is what we're talking about. With, it, it always has to come first, this encounter with the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit does move to bring repentance and faith within us, we're gifted with two new realities. And we're not going to spend much time on this because we're going to focus a lot in January in a series on these things. But number one, we all receive a spiritual gift that enables us to do the kind of work that Jesus did. So if you want to do the work that Jesus did, it's not something you can just do. It, it has to come through the Holy Spirit. And number two, we're empowered to grow the kind of inward character that manifests itself as fruit of the Spirit. And so that's the, the character realities of Christ. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. Now, it's the character within you that will dictate how you actually behave in the Christian life. We can't force ourselves to just act a certain way and somehow think that's going to kind of get us there. Christ is always concerned about what's happening inside of us. And what happens inside of us begins with the movement of the Holy Spirit. But once the power of the Holy Spirit has come in and, and led us to repent and turned our hearts towards Christ, we have a role to play. And, and this is really important. A lot of times in the church, we talk so much about the power of God and the Holy Spirit that we almost abdicate our own personal responsibility as having anything to do with the development of Christian character and, and then Christian behavior. But that is completely inaccurate. You know, you can know all about weightlifting, and you can have lots of people tell you about weightlifting, and you can hang out with weightlifters, but your muscles are going to start very, very puny unless you actually start pumping the iron. And that's true about your, your character formation, too. Your, your, your character cannot be formed by anyone else. It has to do with you responding to the movement of the Holy Spirit and actually making choices and actually doing something with your life. And so when we look to the triangle, let's bring that back for a second, the Holy Spirit is dominant and on top, but this plane on the bottom of the two points is what happens in your life and the way that you choose to live your life. And the, all three of these components are essential for spiritual growth and transformation. You can't just have the Holy Spirit do his thing and your character suddenly going to be transformed. It works itself out in these trials of daily life and in the way that you choose to live your life. Remember um, in Philippians 2, Paul says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. This is the place of the workout on points two and three. I'll touch on point two very quickly and come back to it in just a minute. But essentially, to sum it up, spiritual transformation is greatly influenced and refined within the events of our life, all of them. The circumstances of our lives are what they are, and they make us who we are. So spiritual growth must always take place in real time and in the midst of our busy lives, in the face of temptations, in the very messy reality <laughs> that makes up our relational world and our physical day-to-day -day living. And this is probably where most of us feel pretty upside down. So I'm going to come back and focus on that in just a minute. But the, 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 the third part of the triangle is the intentional spiritual disciplines or practices of our lives. You know, if you think about your life seven days a week, there are those things that have happened to you. There are those things that have happened around you. There are those things like the economy or, you know, your boss walks in and you lose your job or or all kinds of circumstances that happen to you. But then there's a part of your life that is what you actually plan and choose and then actually do with your life. And this third part is important because it's not just reacting to life, but we can be proactive in our lives, can't we? And Paul says in Colossians 3, he's, he's essentially telling the church, look, if you're going to grow spiritually, you need to do some spiritual exercise. If you're, if you're going to grow Christian character, there are certain practices that you must plan to do and then discipline yourself to be part of on a regular basis. And this is what he says, Colossians 3, 12, 17. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ 
rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. You see, Paul just described, he just described all the things we're, we should be doing on purpose. The, 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 the things we should plan and, and do as, as often and as regularly as possible. We practice these things. We, we clothe ourselves with these things. We put these things on. In other words, this is how we're going to actually execute ruling our little kingdom that God entrusted to us with these practices, with these clothes on, with, with this kind of an attitude. And you choose to do that, and you regularly practice that. We're never going to be able to develop spiritual muscles and spiritual character unless we actually choose and plan to live our lives differently than what our secular society says is normal. So you have to ask yourself, how will you choose to spend your time what music will you choose to sing and listen to? What will you choose to fill your mind with? How will you choose to speak to other people? What will you choose to, to view with your eyes? How, how much time will you choose to pray or to worship, to read the scripture, to spend in silence, to slow down and just revel in thanksgiving? Will you choose to foster accountable relationships with a life group or with an accountability partner? One-third of spiritual transformation has to do with how we plan and choose to live our lives on a daily basis. But keep in mind that when you think of this triangle, that doesn't exist on its own. It exists in tandem. It's fully connected with the power of the Holy Spirit in our everyday lives of circumstances. So we can't just go out and choose to live a spiritually disciplined life without first having this encounter with the Holy Spirit and, and prayer and living in fellowship with Christ. John, uh, what Christ said in John 15, without me you can do nothing. Well, that is true, but this is also true. If we do nothing in general, we'll be without him, <laughs> okay? So it, it is true that you can do nothing without Christ, but Christ did not call you to do nothing. He has given you power in, in, in this little kingdom and he wants you to rule and reign it wisely and that uh, entails making some choices about how you're going to live a disciplined life. So we've talked a lot about the power of the Holy Spirit and this third point over here about how we choose to live our lives in disciplined life. But I want to go back and revisit point number two about the daily mess of our lives, the circumstances, not only of what's happening now, but what's happened in our past. Listen to what James says in chapter one, verses two through four. Consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And one of the greatest barriers to spiritual growth is dealing with our past, dealing with our pain, dealing with our habitual tendency to believe that our circumstances are not right. In other words, we, we carry this deep resentment towards our parents, or we blame a traumatic event or a time of suffering or loss for the reasons why we are rightfully angry and indignant or suspicious or somehow an innocent victim of life's circumstances. But that way of thinking separates us from God. Listen to what Willard says about this. We will never have the easy, unhesitating love of God that makes obedience to Jesus our natural response unless we are absolutely sure that it is good for us to be and to be who we are. This means we must have no doubt that the path appointed for us by when and where and to whom we were born is good and that nothing irredeemable has happened to us or can happen to us on our way to our destiny in God's full world. Any doubt, listen, any doubt on this point gives force to the soul-numbing idea that God's commandments are, after all, only for his benefit and enjoyment, and that in the final analysis, we must look out after ourselves. Resentment towards God, not love, 
is the outcome, and from such a condition, it is impossible to consistently do the deeds of love. Now, before you shut down on me, <laughs> let me let me say something clearly. I, I know that we are not all equal in the pain that we've had to endure in our lives. I, I get that. I don't know all that you've endured. And I respect that, that many of you have endured injuries or, or loss or, or abuse that I can't possibly fathom. But here's the deal. Trusting God enough to act as though it, he is actually good and his plans are actually for our benefit and for the fulfillment of the kingdom means coming to grips with the circumstances of your life as that which is ultimately good and blessed in God's kingdom with full hope and certainty of a blessed and joyful future in his kingdom now and his kingdom to come. Now, if we hold on to our pain as this badge of honor, if we curse our parents, if we curse ourselves, if we rehearse our disappointments and we allow past tragedies to be the central focus of our lives, we will forever doubt God's goodness and his perfect intentions for our lives, and we will live in unbelief. The inevitable pains and injuries of this life are the rocks upon which well-intentioned faith is daily shipwrecked. So many of us are hardwired with this internal sense of justice, and our perspective of God is rattled when we see and endure injustice and painful circumstances. I don't know how many of you read the paper this week about the young lady who was recently rescued, Cynthia Cordes, is a prosecutor. She's a member of our church. She was actually quoted in the, in the article. Uh, this lady had endured years of being a sexual slave to a deviant uh, behavior kind of person, and uh, the details were just terrible. And we read things like that, and we doubt God's goodness, or we doubt God's power, or both. We ask questions like this, where was God when my parents were screaming at each other and my father beat me? Where was God when I was sexually abused? Where was God when I lost my spouse or my child or my job? Our sense of resentment and distrust isn't just about our past, though. It extends to our current circumstances. I hear, things, I hear people say things like, I believe in God when he pays my mortgage. I believe in God when he cures me from cancer. I believe in God when he provides me a job or a spouse or a child. We want our predetermined definitions of justice to be fulfilled in our lives and in the lives of those we love before we're ever going to be willing to actually trust the goodness and power of God. And therefore, we don't actually believe that God loves us. And of course, then we don't love God back. And we don't trust his plans. But can you see how upside down that is? Listen to what Willard says. He says, we must accept the circumstances we constantly find ourselves in as the place of God's kingdom and blessing. Let me say it again. We must accept the circumstances we constantly find ourselves in as the place of God's kingdom and blessing. God has yet to bless anyone except where they actually are. And if we faithlessly discard situation after situation, moment after moment, as not being right, we will simply have no place to receive his kingdom into our life. For those situations and moments are our life. Listen. You are who you are exactly because of what has happened in your life up to this very moment. We do not have the luxury of stepping outside of our actual lives to critique who we should have been or how we should have been had our circumstances been different as a child or even our circumstances were different right now. One of the, the very corruptive fallen habits of unbelief that exists within much much of us, it must be changed, is thinking that somehow our lives were supposed to be so much better. But because of somebody's wrongdoing, we are now victims of circumstance or of evil people or, or even maybe our own bad choices and therefore God is powerless to really do anything with our lives or God has somehow uh, been negligent to allow these circumstances to exist in our lives. That is inaccurate 
and destructive thinking. Listen, God absolutely cares about who you are right now. And God meets us exactly where we are and as we are, which is perfectly within the reach of the kingdom of heaven, which is now. There are no alternative set of circumstances for your past or your present life. It is what it is, and it is good. It's ultimately good. It's good that you are, and it's good that you are you. God's love and intentions for your life are perfectly prepared for who you are and where you are and how you are right now. Now, this takes a little bit of faith, and it takes a lot of work. Because in consumer Christianity, that really reigns and rules throughout America's churches, people come and they want to exercise some degree of faith or, or receive the grace of God in order to achieve forgiveness and salvation when they die. And what they're really hoping is that by me somehow being a religious person, it's going to better my circumstances. But <laughs> read what the Bible says. Listen to what Jesus says. And here's what we'll find. That God uses all of the circumstances of our lives to improve us. Paul says in Philippians 4 that he has learned to be content whatever the circumstances in every situation, whether he's hungry or well-fed, whether he's living plenty or in want. Why? Because it is Christ who strengthens and sustains, and he is confident that God will receive glory in his life, in his circumstances, and in his death. Whatever comes. Now let me tell you a little bit about Paul. <laughs> Here's a guy who was arrested numerous times, flogged, beaten, jailed, stoned, shipwrecked, and walked thousands and thousands of miles through treacherous territories, was robbed, and, and all of that. You know, most of us are waiting to believe in God until our circumstances change. Have you ever considered that God is waiting for your circumstances to change you? You know, I, I, I would have never chosen many of the circumstances of my life. I would have been much taller for one. <laughs> but the circumstances of my past and my present make me the man that I am right now with all the glory and all the brokenness that comes along with that. My past and my present is not perfect, but it is good. And I'll tell you why. Because God can use a guy like me to accomplish his perfectly good will. And the more that God accomplishes through my life, watch this, the more he redeems my past and my present circumstances. And that is true for you as well. You see, the justice that we all long for won't come by us sitting around resenting God and doubting his love for us. The justice we long for will only come when we accept our circumstances and allow the love of God to begin to transform us from the inside out and use us for eternity. And every time God does that, he redeems our circumstances. You know, this Saturday, hundreds of church members from Colonial will be serving the Kansas City metro area in the name of Christ. We'll serve others that we've never met, that we don't know, because of God's love for us and God's love for them. And with every stroke of the paintbrush, with every weed picked or bag stuff, we'll be distributing the love and justice of God to a hurting world. Now, the impact of our service is far more compelling because of the circumstances that are currently in your life as well as the circumstances of your past. If all of you were perfect people who came from perfect backgrounds and perfect families and had every perfect circumstance just lined right up, you going out and serving would not be compelling at all. But what's going to be compelling is that as you're painting, as you're doing the work of serving, the people you serve alongside will begin to learn about who you are. They'll begin to learn that you came from an abusive background. You came from a broken home. You recently lost your job. You're struggling with cancer recovery. And it's the very circumstances of your life that makes the love of God so compelling when we actually live it out. So Colonial, remember the triangle. It's very simple. The work of the Holy Spirit, what you choose and plan to do with your life, 
and then the circumstances of your life, it's the very rich context in which all of this is worked out. The world is waiting for the church to show them what right side up looks like. This morning, I call each and every one of you to repent, to believe, to act as if it is so, to practice and to teach what Christ taught us so that all the world will come to know and see in us the love of God and Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Lord, it's so easy for us to believe information about you, to believe the history about what happened in the life of Christ and how he died and, and rose again. But at the point where it becomes personal, at the point where it has a claim upon our lives and the decisions we make and the way we spend our time, it's so easy for us to, to pull out our unbelief and say, yeah, but what about? What about my past? What about what I read in the paper? What about the Holocaust? What about, what about these circumstances that I find myself in right now? And because of these realities, we doubt your goodness and your power. And yet it is these very circumstances that you, you choose to use to bring you glory, to advance your kingdom. And every time you do that, Father, you promise to redeem our circumstances. Help us to have the faith to believe that and to begin to live not just today, but Monday through Friday, particularly Saturday, in a way that will bring you glory and trust you in all the circumstances of our lives. Help us to make right choices about how we're going to choose our time and live in some degree of a disciplined life where we change our habits. But Father, we can do nothing without the power of your Holy Spirit. And if there's even one person here today who's never actually met Jesus Christ, who's never, who's never experienced the movement of the Holy Spirit in their hearts, I pray that you would lead them to that conviction today. Father, we love you and we believe. Help us with our unbelief. Teach us to live as you taught us. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.